שלום לכם. במהלך רוב הקורס דיברנו על תקשורת המדע כמעשה אינדיבידואלי. מדענית מסוימת לומדת להנגיש, מהנדס מסוים משתתף בדיאלוג, אזרחים פרטיים לוקחים חלק במחקר מדעי. אבל יש לתקשורת המדע גם מימד מוסדי, מבחינת קביעת המדיניות והאסטרטגיה. האדם שיכול להסביר לנו איך תקשורת המדע עובדת ברמת ארגונים וממשלות הוא דוקטור ג'יימס גיליס, מי שעמד בראש יחידת התקשורת של סרן, המרכז הגדול בעולם לחקר חלקיקים. בסרן חברות 22 מדינות, ובהן ישראל, והוא פועל כמרכז בינלאומי שמעסיק אלפים רבים של פיזיקאים מרחבי העולם. וזה גם מוסד שצריך תקציבים עצומים מממשלות שונות כדי לבנות ולתחזק את מיצי החלקיקים שלו. וכדי שנוכל לשוחח, אני אעבור עכשיו לאנגלית. שלום ולכם לדוקטור ג'יימס גיליס, Head of the Community Engagement at CERN. Welcome, James. Hello. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, CERN's communication strategy is geared towards maintaining an increasing support from current member states and attracting new member and associate member states, which sounds like uh, it requires governments and other top-level decision makers to get on board. What messages, channels and activities were designed for this audience? Well, that's certainly one of our one of our core messages actually and one of our core audiences is is governments of member states and prospective member states and um, our messaging to them always is that uh, you know, that the sun is sun is an essential part what we do is an essential part of, of being human actually I mean our, our main our main mission at CERN is to do fundamental research into the universe at the most uh, basic level how it works uh, our product is knowledge but in the background to that and this is an increasingly important message for our member states. Uh, when you bring people from all over the place together to work towards common goals and they have technological hurdles to overcome, uh, then they don't understand the word impossible. So a lot of technology is developed at CERN as well. So you know, our messages are, are, are basically, if I can just sum them up for, fourfold actually. I mean, first of all, we exist to do fundamental research, which is, which is part of what it is to be human. In pursuing that fundamental research, we bring people from all over the world together, from all different walks of life together, To pursue goals that are shared by all of humanity and when you get those people together they develop technologies that otherwise would not exist and there are many many examples of history of certain technologies that have been developed in the name of basic research that have gone on to have uh, vast societal impacts beyond and of course the kind of science that we do um, is the kind of science that can capture people's imagination that can inspire younger generations into science so our, our fourth key message really is that we Uh, we provide a very important role in both informal and, edu and, and formal education uh, in science, technology, engineering and mathematics subjects. But do these top level uh, politicians care about basic science? They care about the, I mean, some of them do, yes. I mean, I think if you ask me that question, every human being that I talk to at some level is curious. Everybody looks at the stars, everybody wonders about our place in the universe. So mm -hmm. to some level, they do. I guess that when, if you ask, you know, if that, that's them on a personal level, if you ask them on a professional level, do they care? Well, they care. They certainly care about the education and they certainly care about the technology and they certainly care about the diplomacy. So, so those three messages are, are very important to us as well. The communication strategy seeks also to enable CERN to serve as an effective voice for fundamental research in relevant multilateral debates and with the public. How is CERN involved in public discussions and, and why? Well, there, could, there are many possible answers to that. I mean, we, we are a publicly funded organization. We, are, we owe all of our funding to, to taxpayers in our member states, um, most of. And, um, and therefore, I think there's a moral duty for us to communicate. But, but more importantly than that, You know, we, we increasingly live in a world that is dominated by science and technology. We've seen that very clearly over the last year. Um, and it's important for people not only to understand the results of science, but understand the evidence-based um, decision-making process that goes into science. So, so for us, it's extremely important to engage with people. And we do it, we do it in many, many, many ways. And we... Um, CERN has always taken its, its communications functions very seriously. Uh, today, education, communication and outreach is, a, is a, a very substantial group of people at CERN who are involved with you know, all kinds of communication, ranging from formal education of, of students from primary school up to university level and beyond, to education of teachers, to public engagement with, with science. And uh, so, yeah, so it, it's just something that we think is increasingly essential just to enable people 
to live in an increasingly technologically based world where they have to make decisions based on the best available evidence uh, almost on a daily basis. Well, a decade ago, in 2008, before the Large Hadron Collider went operative, there was a global media coverage of uh, a concern that the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, would create a planet-eating black hole. Uh, this is an amazing story, since media audiences and policymakers alike couldn't really understand the claim, so we all, all had to either trust you guys at CERN and disregard it as funny, or really become hysterical that we're all gonna die. What was yeah. your strategy for explaining the science uh, and the uncertainty involved? Well, first of all, let me say, I mean, it's, it's, it's true that all of that built up the profile of CERN, the visibility of CERN, there is no doubt about that. Um, but it wasn't funny. You know, I certainly didn't find it funny at all at the time. Um, but it was out there. It was, it was actually social media that enabled this to happen, um, to get out there, that enabled pe the, the people who've been saying particle physics is dangerous have been around for a very long time. They, they were there when we switched on our last particle accelerator um, back in 1989. They were there when the Americans switched on new machines at mm. big laboratories there, Fermilab and Brookhaven. But they didn't have the platform that social media allowed them to have. So it was very, very clear very early on that, that this was generating a lot of conversation in social media and that it was going to jump into the mainstream media um, very quickly. And, it, and of course it did. So we had to take a decision. What do we do about it? Do we just mm -hmm. say that it's a load of rubbish? Do we pretend it, try to pretend it doesn't exist or do we engage with it and, and get in on the story? So the, the approach that we took was to take a conscious decision that we wanted to be part of this conversation, mm -hmm. not just any part of this conversation. We wanted to be a trustworthy, honest, and authoritative voice on this conversation. Mm -hmm. So we really engaged with it right from the start. Um, and the way that we, we, we dealt with it was to, to treat all our audiences as, as being thinking, rational, intelligent people mm -hmm. and explain to them what, what, what the actual facts were. And those facts were that, um, you know, CERN was not going to do anything with the Large Hadron Collider that wasn't happening in nature already anyway. Mm -hmm. um, that, uh, that we observe the kind of collisions that, that we produce in the LHC in nature, in cosmic radiation, all the time, at energies you know, equal to and much, much higher than the LHC. That um, you know, there was no, that the Earth hadn't, hadn't disappeared from that. So if the Earth was safe against that, it was going to be safe against the LHC. There were all sorts of, um, uh, you know, theoretical reasons to think that the LHC wasn't going to do anything, but the, the basic argument we used was, was based on observation. And uh, I remember if I can just digress into one little sort of kind of personal anecdote here that I remember once reading on a blog uh, from somebody who was a real science supporter, who was getting a little bit fed up of all of this hype about black holes saying that, well, if they manage to, uh, to ban CERN, then we'd better uh, ban wardrobes because I don't want my kids ending up in Narnia. <laughs> now, I, I don't know how, how, if that's a cultural reference that's really well understood, but the, the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, these kids go through a wardrobe and on the other side is another universe, right? So, you know, I, I sat down and I calculated on the basis of our observation. Now, observation is what, what's the key here. Um, the probability of, of going through a wardrobe and finding yourself in another universe based on how long wardrobes have existed, how many times the doors have been opened, how many times... <laughs> nobody to our knowledge has ended up in another universe and it ends up to be a really really tiny number of course but just because every time you open your wardrobe doors you just find your clothes you don't find another universe doesn't mean that the next time there might be another universe that's the scientific way of thinking it might just be a process that's incredibly rare mm -hmm. right so you end up with this really tiny number and then based on our observations of if you compare that based on our observations of cosmic rays producing uh, collisions like the lhc at the same energies and higher um, you end up working out that the, the risk of the LHC uh, running for 40 years is, is tens of thousands of times less than the risk of opening your wardrobe door the next time and finding yourself in Narnia. So you know, all that just to say that we, we, we treated our audiences as people who were receptive to analytical thought and, uh, and, and, and able to, to respond well to being treated as intelligent people rather than just being told, well, you don't understand, you're stupid. And I think that's a that's a very a very important lesson for me in terms of communicating science. The more the more intelligent you treat your audiences, the more intelligently they seem to behave. Interesting. 
Uh, do you yeah. think that this concern also was the reason for the astounding audience of about a billion people worldwide who watched the first circulation of the Large Hadron Collider? Well, yeah, since I, was, since I was head of communications at CERN at the time, I'd like to think that we had a little bit to do with that. But uh, <laughs> realistically, of course, yes, I mean, it was. The, this, all the hype around black holes was certainly a very strong part of, of why, um, why we were as visible as we were. And there were all kinds of other factors as well. You know, I think that, that um, you know, the LHC, the project, is just an incredible project. It's an amazing project. It's just amazing that, that human beings, first of all, do something as large and complicated as that just because they want to understand the universe. Uh, secondly, that they're actually capable of, of, of doing that and, and building a machine like that that can probe the mysteries of the universe to such a deep level is just an amazing story. Um, and the story of, of international collaboration, people from all over the world coming together and working together to do this for the common good. Um, you know, it, it's, it's just, it's a great story in its own right. There's no doubt in my mind about that. Um, but there's also no doubt that the black hole myth helped to drive our visibility. Uh, there were other things, you know, there were, there were, we, we appeared in fiction on a couple of occasions. And then, yes, I think that, uh, that the way that CERN handled the communications, being open and transparent and really trying to reach out and engage with audiences um, also helped. So you just mentioned that it wasn't the first time you appeared in popular culture. And I'm thinking about Dan Brown's science fiction novel, Angels and Demons. And uh, when there, is, there was a plot to blow up the Vatican, I think, using antimatter that was stolen Sorry, from yeah. CERN. And how do you, as, as a head of communication at the time, how do you respond when something like that reframes you in the public sphere as a potentially dangerous place? Well, we were, we were fortunate, actually, in this case, in that um, Angels and Demons was Dan Brown's first novel. And it was published, I think, in 2000. Um, and it didn't do very well at all. But um, Dan Brown sent a copy to my boss, um, whose name was Neil, and he signed it, you know, Dear Neil, remember it's only fiction, Dan Brown. Um, so my boss at the time, uh, first of all, came to CERN to teach technical English. He, he was an English major, mm -hmm. and he read three pages and said, this is rubbish, you read it. And because he was the boss, I had to read it. And, you know, what my conclusion was, well, First of all, Dan Brown is a really good storyteller. It's a really gripping story, but I'm afraid to say he's not a great writer. It was just not nicely written. And, and the first half of the book takes place at CERN. And I found myself on every page saying, no, 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 it's not like that. That's not true. That's not true. It's all rubbish. And then the second part takes place in Rome, where I, I presume it's, it's equally factually inaccurate. But because I didn't know about you know, Rome, Italian art history, I don't know. And I just found it was a really interesting read. So I remember we had a discussion around in 2000 that, you know, if this, if people buy this book, then we're going to have to take a decision on how we deal with it. And again, it was the same thing. Do we ignore it? Do we say Dan Brown is a charlatan and it should be, you know, his book should be burned or whatever? Or do we just engage with it and say, well, you know, the real story of antimatter is much more interesting than this. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. So um, so then when five years later it was, when the next novel of Dan Brown started to do really well, Da Vinci Code, um, I sort of found myself, um, I was head of comms by this point, and I, I found myself in the Director General's office saying, you know, there is this book, and, um, and it, it tells the story of stealing a quarter of a gram of antimatter, and you know, a quarter of a gram, that would take us 250 million years to make that much. Yes, I know, but in the book it happens, and it goes to Rome, it blows up the Vatican, and I think we should put it on the homepage. And um, to his great credit, he said, yes. Mm -hmm. So we engaged with it from the start. So when people started buying this book and they went to CERN, the first thing they would find on the CERN homepage in 2005 was a picture of um, something called a Lockheed X-33 space plane, which appears in the novel. And it's what we keep very top secret and we use to fly across the Atlantic in 45 minutes. Or do we? And we just played it that way. So we had a, you, you click through, does play, does CERN have one of these? And then we had a, a multiple choice. You know, does CERN have one of these? No, we don't. Do we make antimatter? Yes, we do. Uh, could we make the amount of antimatter in Angels and Demons? Yes, we could. How long would it take? 250 million years um, flat out. Uh, what do we do with the antimatter? Well, we try to understand mysteries of the universe. Is there any practical use for the antimatter? Yes, if you've uh, ever had a PET scan, uh, you have um, benefited from technology developed directly at CERN. So what we did was, was engage with the story and try to treat it uh, as an opportunity. And I think that's also um, a good message for science communicators. If something comes along and you think this is horrible and it's a real threat to us, 
-hmm. but if you, but you can't do anything about it, then you better look for ways to turn it into an opportunity. And, um, and then later, of course, when, when, when they made the film, we had, uh, we had um, Tom Hanks and we had um, uh, got Ron Howard at CERN and uh, they were really enthusiastic. They loved CERN, they were amazed by it. Um, and um, and we, we read the script. I had a copy of the script that had, you know, had secret or something like that written on it. And we had to sign agreements that said, if I divulged any of the content of the, the script, I'd be in deep trouble and things like this. And <laughs> for us, the, um, the, the script was okay. Uh, and the reason that the rationale we, 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 we took for, for engaging with the film and talking with the producers and, and helping them, you know, Ron, Ron Howard, he wanted to tell the amazing ticking bomb story. Uh, and he just wanted to hide away all the bad science. And he did that very well, I think, if you, if you watch the film. Um, but the criteria was that the scientists were portrayed as the heroes. And to us, the, the, you know, the best thing about it back then was that the you know, Tom Hanks is not the hero of that film. The hero of that film is actually was actually a young lady called Ayelet Zura, uh, uh, an Israeli actress who played the heroine who figured out what was going on and saved the day. So it was it, the, the way that they that they portrayed the scientific endeavor was good, even if the science was wrong, and that's why we engaged with it. And we also felt that um, to have you know in the credits at the end, thanks to CERN, would actually diffuse it if people read and watch the credits and they watch that end and they think all CERN was involved they can't be worried by this that's an in, implicit message there and um and Ron Howard and Tom Hanks also made a, a short 15 minute film that you get if you buy the, the DVD saying what a great place CERN is so again it was it was just it was something that came along that looked like a threat and you just had to turn it around you can't you can't make it go away so we took the approach let's 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 make this an opportunity so another potential threat or um, that he turned into opportunity is the story of the Higgs boson that was also called uh, the God particle in, in many, in many yeah. media, uh, much of the media coverage. And are you happy with the turn that uh, made Higgs boson into the God particle on one hand, much more interest that just a Higgs boson would get on the other hand, maybe representing science in a weird and unpredicted way it's it is that's an interesting story as well and i i, I guess you you i probably know how that name came about actually i mean it was uh, it was a book from a nobel prize winning physicist in the states leon lederman um who he said he wanted to call it he called it the goddamn particle because it was so hard to find but his publisher called the god particle because it's so important right and certainly the fact that it's, it's got known as the God particle really divides opinion in physics circle. There are people who think, okay, and they live with it. And there are people who hate it. There are people who say it's got nothing to do with God. There are people who will say, well, it's got nothing to do with God, but it has this really important role in, in our understanding of the universe. Without it, we would not be here asking questions about it. We just wouldn't be able to exist. It's, it's that important in, in our understanding of the universe at the moment. So, um, so yeah, again, it, it's there. You 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 can't you can't get away from the fact that it's out there. Um, you know, there are there are. There's no doubt that 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 if you put God in the title of popular science books, you sell books. Ask Paul Davis, who's written a range of books about with titles like God and the New Physics, where he examines the limit between what physics can understand and what what physics can't understand, which is a very valid question to ask. So yeah, that was again something that that uh, that we we learned to live with. Well, Dr. James Gillis, thank you so very much for joining us today and for these really interesting insights from your work at CERN. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.